Well, good evening. We are in lesson 15. This is the final lesson in the Work of the Cross series, and it's called uh, God's Top Ten Principles. We may have many more than that, but these are major, major truths, major doctrines that we really want to settle in our hearts uh, that, that will strengthen us, that will bolster our faith, that will uh, give us more confidence in our walk with God. Our, our first principle that we're going to look at tonight is that when Jesus went to the cross and said it was finished, he was finished. He accomplished what he came to, to this world to do, and um, now it's available. You know, he inaugurated the new covenant in his precious blood, and with that covenant are many, many blessings. You know, among them are the forgiveness of our sins, the promise of eternal life, a relationship with the God of this universe. And so this first point um, is just, to, just simply to confirm in our mind that it is complete. It is finished. There's, there's nothing to be added uh, to the will of God. And we begin in Genesis 3.15, that ancient uh, first promise of the Redeemer. And what was promised back then, we'll see, is, has been completed at the cross. But I will put enmity <clears throat> between you and the woman. This is God speaking, uh, actually cursing the serpent for deceiving Adam and Eve. Uh, this is the consequence meted out to him. I'll put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise you on the head, you shall bruise him on the heel. So it introduces this, this age-long conflict between the devil and, and Christ. And that uh, pronouncement that the, the devil would bruise Christ, that Christ would ultimately crush the head of the serpent, destroy his lies, conquer, uh, destroy the work of the devil. Uh, Galatians 1 3 and 4. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ who gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us out of this present age according to the will of according to the will of our God and Father. And so it speaks of his redeeming work on the cross. I'm not sure what I did with my marker. There it is. Okay, thank you. It speaks of the Lord's redeeming work here on the cross where he finished and accomplished all of those promises uh, given in the Old Testament. Uh, 1 John 3, verse 8. He that commits sin is of the devil, for the devil sins from the beginning. For this purpose the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. Hallelujah. And he did that at the cross. That's where uh, Satan was bound. He bound from deceiving the nations because the work of redemption is, is done. And he is given us the power through his atoning work, through his blood, to walk in victory. His blood cleansed our conscience, 
And so that verse is very clear. He came to destroy the works of the devil. And he did that. At John 4, verse 34. Jesus said unto them, My meat is to do the will of him that sent me, and to finish his work. And did he do that? Yes. Did he finish it? Yes, he yes. did. At John 19, 30. When Jesus therefore had received the sour wine, he said, It is finished. He bowed his head, gave up his spirit. So again, that he had a sense when he was expiring on the cross, he said, it's finished. He had accomplished what he came into this world to do, and the Father accepted that as well. When he returned to heaven and presented himself, the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. So it's finished. So that's that's our first principle that we need to understand that that what He has made provision for us is done. Of course, our part is, you know, to enter in to the finished work of Christ. You know, to make it to make application of it in our own life. And so there's nothing more to be added. He said, when it's finished, it's finished. So that's our first principle. Our second principle, um, God is not respecting, I don't like that wording there, uh, he is impartial. God is impartial as to who can have which part of that finished work. The Bible does use, he is not a respecter of persons. So that's where that, verbiage comes from. God is not respecting who can have which part of that finished work. <clears throat> In other words, he makes it available to the whole world. And I'm, I'm very grateful for that as well, because there's those in theology that they would have us believe it's only made for a select few. You know, and it's not just for one nation, but it's for all people, all kindreds, all tribes. And so again, this is something we should be very, very thankful for. Uh, the impartiality of God. Acts 10, 34 through 35. Then Peter opened his mouth and said of the truth, I perceive that God is no respecter of persons, but in every nation he that fears him and works righteousness is accepted with him. So this, this was quite a statement, especially uh, in in that era, in the New mm -hmm. Testament times, when when they're dealing with the Jews who had for centuries had it ingrained in their consciousness that they were the favored children of God. Mm -hmm. And all the Gentiles were just, you know, not not worthy to be considered. Mm -hmm. uh, but here, as, as Peter preaches... In the book of Acts, he brings forth the truth that no, God's not a respecter of, of persons. That in every nation, men that fear him can be accepted. Romans 2.11 For there is no respect of persons with God. Yes, so again, no partiality. You know, that concept mm. is presented in, when we think about justice. Uh, the, the statue of justice that stands before the Supreme Court, you know, Lady Justice has a blindfold over her eyes, you know, and holding the, the scales of justice. Mm -hmm. But the idea that the blindfold is portraying is, you know, I'm not going to look at you whether you're rich or poor, male or female, black or white, uh, you know, I'm not going to look at any of that. Mm -hmm. You know, we're going to look at the law <laughs> and and what you've done. You know, we're just seeking the truth. Mm -hmm. And so the, just God's justice is, is impartial. And we've heard this time and time again. Uh, Ephesians 6, verse 9. 
And ye masters, do the same things unto them, forbearing threatening, knowing that your master also is in heaven, neither is there respect of persons with him. Yes. And so God was actually, uh, the apostle was actually speaking to slaveholders. And he said, treat your slave with, with honor and respect. Um, because there's no partiality with God. In his sight, each of your souls is equally valuable. You know, he, he died for both of you. You know, so in God's eyes, there's no difference. Uh, uh, 1 Peter 1, 17. And if you call on the Father, who without respect of persons, judges according to every man's work, Pass the time of your sojourning here in fear. Speaking again of his impartiality. And he's talking to the believers and he's saying because God is impartial, you know, believe you as believers will watch yourself. You know, remain in that relationship. Don't just think that because you know you've made a profession of faith, you've been baptized, you're you've even been born again, he's not a respecter of persons, you know, remain in that relationship and don't throw away your your hope. Do you have the James 2, 1 through 9? Or the first yes. Two? Okay. James uh, 2, 1 through 9. <clears throat> My brethren, have not the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory with respect of persons, for if there come unto your assembly a man with a gold ring and goodly apparel, and there come is also a poor man in vile raiment, and ye have respect for him that wears the gay clothing, and say unto him, Sit thou here in a good place, and say to the poor, Stand thou there, or sit here under my footstool. Are ye not then partial in yourselves, and are become judges of evil thoughts? Hearken, my beloved brethren, Hath not God chosen the poor of this world, rich in faith, and heirs of the kingdom, which he hath promised to them that love him? But ye have despised the poor. Do not rich men oppress you, and draw you before the judgment seats? Do not they blaspheme that worthy name by the which ye are called? If ye fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, ye do well. But if ye have respect to persons, ye commit sin, and are convinced of the law as trans uh, and are convinced of the law as transgressors. Yeah, that's a very strong passage there, and he James addresses addresses it to my brethren, and he said, um, you know, you need to be impartial. You know, whether the rich or the poor, uh, walk into your church. You know, you, you treat them the same. Mm -hmm. And verse 8, he says, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Mm -hmm. But if you show partiality, uh, and of course showing partiality would be when you do not love your neighbor as yourself. You treat him differently uh, than you would treat yourself or than you would wish to be treated by others. 1 Timothy 2, 3 and 4. First Timothy 2, 3 and 4. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. Yes, all men to be saved. Second uh, Peter 3, 9 is a similar verse. The Lord is not slow about his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. 
again, showing us he's not a respecter of persons. He, he wants everyone. And again, I, it, it confounds my mind to think that there are you know, schools of theology that, that don't believe that, but believe that before the foundation of the world, a small portion were selected to be saved and, and the rest were reprobated and mm -hmm. you know, selected to be hell bound. Mm -hmm. uh, to me, I, I, I don't see how you can reconcile that with the love of God. Uh, in the fact that he is not a respecter of persons. We have Luke 4, 16 through 27. And he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for to read. And there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah, and when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captive, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, mm. to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And he closed the book. And he gave it again to the minister and sat down. And the eyes of all them that were in the synagogue were fastened on him. And he began to say unto them, This day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. And all bear him witness and wondered at the gracious words which proceeded out of his mouth. And they said, Is not this Joseph's son? And he said unto them, Ye will surely say unto me this proverb, Physician, heal thyself. Whatsoever we have heard done in Capernaum, do also here in thy country. And he said, Verily I say unto you, No prophet is accepted in his own country. But I tell you of a truth. Many widows were in Israel in the days of Elijah, when the heaven was shut up three years and six months when great famine was throughout all the land. But unto none of them was Elias, Elijah sent, save unto Sarepta, a city of Sidon, unto a woman that was a widow. 27. Yes. And many lepers were in Israel in the time of Eli Elijah the prophet, and none of them was cleansed, saving Naaman, the Syrian. So in this passage, I think it's interesting that when he stands up and opens to Isaiah 61 and reads about the gospel, about the anointing being upon him to preach the gospel to the poor, to bind up the brokenhearted, liberty of the captives, open the eyes of the blind. You know, they, they didn't have a problem with that. In fact, uh, verse 22, and all were speaking well of him, wondering at the gracious words that were falling from his lips. But, you know, shortly thereafter, when he talked about how God in the Old Testament healed the Syrian, Naaman, and fed the woman of Zarephath, you know, a Gentile, that's when they were really enraged, you know, and, and threw him off. Um, and all this, verse 28, and all in the synagogue were filled with rage when they heard these things. Well, the, <laughs> well, the previous things, <laughs> you know, they, they said, wow, we haven't heard anybody speak like this. But now, yeah. when, he, when he reveals, hey, this gospel is for everyone, that's what gets them riled up. Yeah. You know, that's today. The, the gospel... Uh, is either embraced, it tickles someone's ears, like Jesus said, and my sheep hear my voice. Even mm -hmm. people who have heard it for the first time um, recognize there's some truth here mm -hmm. and don't want to pursue it. Mm -hmm. And then, but the, and then there's other people that reject it. Yes, and there is never any neutral. Oh, that's fine what you believe. Uh, when it comes to Jesus Christ, 
gospel and the gospel of the cross. But now if you were to stand up and say I'm a Buddhist and this is what we believe, they'd say, fine, you do your thing, you know. Mm-hmm. I'm an atheist. There would be no enmity, no friction. Mm-hmm. Right. But the, but the name of Jesus causes people to just get vow it and does. just treat you as anathema, as, as you are yeah. cursed, mm-hmm. or it's embraced. There's never any in-between yeah. ground if, if the gospel mm-hmm. is true. Yeah, it's truly presented. That's, truly presented. That's so true. Mm-hmm. That is so true. Uh, because yes, here they were filled with rage when when he, you know, puts his finger on the area of their selfishness, where they think they're so great and high and mighty and have this inroad with God, and you know the Gentiles are just, you know, the untouchables out there, you know that we don't want to have anything to do with, and so when Jesus brought forth the the really revealed God's impartiality. He loves us all equally. That's when they rose up in anger. And so again, that's our second point here that, that that he is impartial. You know, he's that judge with the, you know, that's not going to look at what tribe we're from, what skin color we happen to have, or mm-hmm. male or female, rich or poor. You know, and that's what true justice should be. Yes. You know, if you call yourself a nation of laws, yes. that's the way it should be. Mm-hmm. Yes. And unfortunately, you know, in our country, it is not that way. In most countries of the world, if you're rich, if you're famous, right. you know, you can buy your way out mm-hmm. of just about anything. And it's very unfortunate because there's, there's very little true justice yes. in this world anymore. Mm-hmm. Uh, I believe at one point in time there may have been, you know, in our early founding, our early history, but, um, you know, we've, 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 we've gone a long way from that point. Mm-hmm. You know, I think even to the IRS, you know, yeah. they, they go after who, who they want to go after, but, but those that are the rich and mighty and, you know, they do their thing, it seemed like, with, with impunity. Uh, but the little guy, you know, they'll they'll just hound and, and go after him, knowing that, you know, who are you? You're, you're never going to stand up against us. But God's justice, you know, it's impartial. I thank him for that. <laughs> I thank him for that. Okay, our third principle is that the entire plan of God for man is based on based on our faith. Uh, and we have Hebrews 2, verse 4. Or, I'm sorry, Habakkuk. That's the Old Testament. Habakkuk, one of the minor prophets. And that's the verse that's quoted many times in the New Testament. Um. Habakkuk 2, verse 4. Behold, his soul, which is lifted up, is not upright in him, but the just shall live by his faith. Yeah, the just shall live by faith. So that was the verse that sparked the Reformation when Martin Luther came across Mm. that. It's repeated here in Romans 1, 17. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. Yes, and as it was written, was pulled out of Habakkuk. Uh, Romans 5, verse 2. Through whom we have also obtained our introduction by faith, into this grace in which we stand, and we exult in hope of the glory of God. And so our faith introduces us to grace. We have obtained our introduction by faith into this grace in which we stand. Galatians 3.11 
Now that no one is justified by the law before God is evident, for the righteous man shall live by faith. Amen. Again, he's quoting from the Old Testament. Uh, Hebrews 10.38 Now the just shall live by faith, but if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. The just shall live by faith, but a warning not to draw back. And Hebrews 11.6 is a beautiful definition. Without faith it's impossible to please him, for he that comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. So if it's without faith, it's impossible to please him. Then we could use the counterpositive and say faith is the very thing that pleases God. He is pleased with our faith. Yes. So the entire plan of God is is based on our faith. Uh, point four. Now we get in more of what faith is. Faith is think, thinking, believing, speaking, and acting on that which cannot be seen. Uh, Romans 4, 17. As, Go ahead. as it is written, I have made thee a father of many nations before him whom he believed, even God, who quickens the dead and calls those things which be not as though they were. <clears throat> and that, that's a pretty good definition of faith. That's, that's faith in action. God calls into being that which does not exist. You know, and he does it by faith. He sees it uh, in his imagination and calls it forth. Yeah. Hebrews 11.1 1, Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence or conviction of things not seen. For by it the men of old gained approval. The assurance of things hoped for. You know, we have that deep, abiding, Lord, you said it. I believe it. I'm going to act upon it. You know, I'm going to trust in it. Mm. Uh, things not hoped for. Second uh, Corinthians five seven. For we walk by faith, not by sight. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's said of the Christian: we're to walk by faith, not by our emotions, not by what we see, mm. um, <clears throat> not by what we feel. Mm. Uh, but by what God says. Uh, Joshua 6, 12 through 16. And Joshua rose early in the morning, and the priests took up the ark of the Lord, and seven priests, bearing seven trumpets of ram's horns, before the ark of the Lord, went on continually, and blew with the trumpets, and the armed men went before them. But the re reward came after the ark of the Lord, the priest going on and blowing with the trumpets. And the second day, they surrounded the city once and returned into the camp. So they did six days. And it came to pass on the seventh day that they rose early about the dawning of the day and surrounded the city after the same manner seven times. Only on that day, they surrounded the city seven times. And it came to pass at the seventh time, when the priests blew with the trumpets, Joshua said unto the people, Shout, for the Lord hath given you the city, and the city, and the city shall be accursed, even it and all that are therein to the Lord. Only Rahab the harlot shall live. 
she and all that are with her in the house, because she hid the messengers that we sent. Mm -hmm. So they're to walk by faith. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, it seemed impossible. You know, you and you mm -hmm. could imagine the doubt coming into the mind of some of the people saying, you know, this is a crazy way to break into a city, just march around it seven times, but but Joshua believed the word of God. He said, you do this, you shout, verse 16, shout for the Lord has given you the city. You know, those are words of faith. Uh, the promise was given. They put steps, they put action to their faith. Uh, and then faith was realized. The walls did come down. They were victorious. Mark eleven twenty two through 24 And Jesus answering saith unto them, Have faith in God, for verily I say unto you, that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, and be that cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass. He shall have whatsoever he saith. Therefore I say unto you, What things soever ye desire when ye pray, believe that ye receive them, and ye shall have them. So that's a very instructive and powerful passage uh, given to the believers, and it shows the, the power of, of the spoken word as well. You know, he says, Whatsoever things you say, you know, and believe. Uh, it's not just flippantly out of the mouth, but, mm -hmm. you know, a deep belief in the heart and then speaking it out of the mouth. He said, you shall have it. You know, if you don't doubt. It's a very, mm -hmm. very strong promise. And it's, it's there for us. And since he's not a respecter of persons, mm -hmm. it's not just for a certain class of Christians, it's, it's for us all. Point number five, he says, faith has already been given to every person. And I would say, not the faith itself, but the ability for faith. He's given us a, a mind, he's given us a, a motion, he's given us a free will. And Romans says he does give us a measure of faith as well. But it's, it's the ability uh, to exercise faith. Faith is our act, you know, based upon the Word of God, based upon the, the object of our faith. And the object of our faith are the promises of God, the very character of God Himself. And our faith is simply that response. Uh, Romans 1, 18-21. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven, against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has showed it unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because that when they knew God, they glorified him, not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. And again, it was darkened because they, they reject truth. Uh, they do not have faith in God, even though his invisible attributes are clearly seen. They, they just reject him. And, and walk away. Romans 2, 14 and 15. For the Gentiles who do not have the law do instinctively or by nature the things of the law. Those not having the law are law unto themselves in that they show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience bearing witness and their thoughts alternately accusing or else defending themselves. And so the point here is the Gentiles that, you know, even the Gentiles 
uh, who are, you know, walking in the light that they have, uh, have a measure of faith. You know, and God deals with them according to the faith that they have. Um, Titus 2.11. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people. Yes. So he again makes it available for all, all people. He makes it available for all. Our part is to come to him by faith and embrace it. Of course, Ephesians 2 8, it tells us that by grace we're saved through faith, mm-hmm. and that not of ourselves. It's a gift of God, not as a result of works, lest any man should boast. So it's a gift of God in the sense that he gives the, makes real the object of our faith. Makes the work of the cross, what Jesus did, just so real and compelling. Our sixth principle that we'll look at is God must honor his word when faith is exercised. And again, I don't like the word must, but I would say he will, yeah. <laughs> you know, because we don't, we don't force God into a box, but he mm-hmm. will honor his holy word, because that's who he is. He cannot deny himself. Matthew 21, 21 and 22. Jesus answered and said unto them, Verily I say unto you, If ye have faith and doubt not, ye shall not only do this, which is done to the fig tree, but also if he shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea, it shall be done. And all things whatsoever ye shall ask in prayer, believing, ye shall receive. Again, in one of those very, very powerful passages, but it's God opening up his heart and and saying, "I I will give it to you. You know, if you if you ask in faith. Mark nine, twenty two and twenty three. <clears throat> and oftentimes it hath cast him into the fire and into the waters to destroy him. But if thou canst do anything, have compassion on us and help us. Jesus said unto him, If thou canst believe, all things are possible to him that believes. Yeah, so 23, if you can, you know, explanation mark. It's like Jesus stands back almost almost like in shock. So what, what do you mean if I can't? You know, he's God. Right? He has the power. Um, if all things are possible to him who believes. And so God will will honor his holy word. You know, and, and it's, it's almost like he's offended when we even question his, his uh, desire uh, to answer prayer in that manner. At least that's how I take this, you know, when Jesus almost seems astonished. What do you mean if I can you know, he has the love, he's got the compassion, he's got the ability, and, and he, will, he will do it. Uh, James 1, 4 through 8. But if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all men generously. I think that's our key here. Mm-hmm. To all men generously and re- without reproach, and it shall be given to him. But let him ask in faith without doubting. For the one who doubts is like the surf of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. For let not that man expect that he'll receive anything from the Lord. Being a double-minded man, unstable 
in all of his ways. So he gives to all men generously. If there's condition, we have to come in faith. We can't go back and forth. We have to stand firm that the promise is uh, God will honor his word. Uh, James 5.15 And the prayer offered in faith will restore the one who is sick and the Lord will raise him up and if he has committed sins they will be forgiven him. So that's for the sick. And James says call for the elders, let them anoint him in oil, call in the name of the Lord, the prayer offered in faith will save the sick. And so God honors that. You know, he, he told the people to do that. You know, that's something that God said, here, this is for you. Mm-hmm. You know, so as a church, you know, we need to say, okay, Lord, this is what your word says. We believe you and trust you. <laughs> and and then you see the results. We had a letter on our table. There was it's actually an older card. I don't you know Doris was clean and it happened to be there, and I read it because it was a former member of our church. And um, one Sunday morning, she requested prayer. Uh, because her kidneys were, she was having a real problem. I think they were shutting down. And she talked about a scale that the doctors have as far as kidney function was concerned, you know, with five being about the worst. And, and um, that's what she had at the time. And uh, she, she said that after the prayer of faith in the church, uh, on her next doctor appointment, was down to a three. Praise <laughs> the Lord. You know, so I just read that this, this wow. afternoon. And just blessed my heart. Yes. You know, Amen. Yes. just another testimony that um, God will do what He says He'll do. Mm-hmm. And so, on your next page, and this is under that the same heading, we had man's part. Now here's God's part. Our part is to trust Him. You know, just say, Lord, this is what your word says. We believe it. We're going to stand on it. Now, here's God's part. And we start with Numbers 23, 19. It says, God is not a man that he should lie, nor a son of man that he should repent. Has he said, and will he not do it? Has he spoken, and will he not make it good? Of course, the obvious answer, yes, he will. And so if he's spoken and said, you know, on the cross, he bore our sin, he carried our sorrows by a strike for heels. You know, that's, that's the basis of our faith. Mm-hmm. And so we, we come before God with confidence, saying, Lord, this is what you said. When you went to the cross, you destroyed every work of the devil. And you said you brought forgiveness, you brought cleansing, you brought healing. You're not a God that you should lie. See, this is where we can use the promises of God in our prayers. And this is a good verse to to memorize and write down and uh, get familiar with. Because it's very powerful. As he said, and will he not do it? Mm-hmm. You know, so he's, he's said it. He's given promises, such as speak to that mountain, difficulty, whatever it is, that, <clears throat> that obstacle in your spiritual path. Speak to it. Don't doubt in your heart. Believe that what you say shall be done. See, so that's, that was his promise. And now... Our confidence is built when we read verses like this, has he said, and will he not do it? Mm. And our answer is, of course he will. Because he's almighty God, he's the author of truth. Jesus said, I am truth. Mm -hmm. I'm not a man that I should lie. Mm -hmm. Um, 
So again, it, these promises build our faith. Amen. First uh, Kings eight fifty six. Eight fifty six. Blessed be the Lord that hath given rest unto his people Israel, according to all that he promised. There hath not failed one word of all his good promise, which he promised by the hand of Moses his servant. Amen. And of course that was given by Solomon, you know, talking about the promises of God that came through Moses. And he said uh, God was faithful to every one of them. And of course we have a New Testament built on better promises. Remember that verse in Hebrews? Mm -hmm. You know, so he was faithful back then, he'll be faithful now. Psalm 89, 33 and 34. <clears throat> Nevertheless, my loving kindness will I not utterly take from him, nor suffer my faithfulness to fail. My covenant will I not break, nor alter the thing that is gone out of my lips. Mm. Another extremely powerful promise. It says, my covenant I will not break. And so Jesus said, a new, a new covenant. You know, this is a new covenant in my blood. And Jesus said, I'm not going to break that. Mm -hmm. And so whatever is contained in that covenant, the blessings of the covenant, that is our inheritance. He said, I, I'm, not, I'm not a covenant-breaking God. I'm a covenant-keeping God. So again, that's the basis of our faith is the unchanging character of God Almighty. Uh, Hebrews 10, Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. Yes, he's faithful. So there's another verse that says he remains faithful even if we happen to be faithless, because he cannot deny himself. He can't deny his character. He's always going to be faithful. Mm -hmm. Psalm 138, 2. Is another very powerful promise. One thirty eight two. I will worship toward thy holy temple and praise thy name for thy loving kindness and for thy truth, for thou hast magnified thy word above all thy name. Magnified thy word. So he says his reputation is at stake in everything that he says. You know, and he's saying, you know, my word is who I am. You know, if I gave you that word, if I said, speak to that mountain, you know, he, he honors that above his name. Again, just to me, that, that's a staggering statement. Mm-hmm. Uh, Romans 4, 20 and 21. He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God, and being fully persuaded that what he had promised, he was able also to perform. Again, a very wonderful definition of faith because we know the story of Abraham he was promised the son he was promised that through his very seed his offspring all of the nations of the earth will be blessed and he waited and waited and waited <laughs> 25 years you know but he waited in faith because he knew that he staggered not in unbelief giving glory to God, being fully assured in his heart that he would, was promised 
is faithful. And so the mm -hmm. prayers might not be answered instantly. You know, they certainly weren't for him, but when we come with a sincere heart to a faithful God, he magnifies his word above his name and, and he'll be faithful. Okay, our seventh of these, uh, you know, very strong principles that the Bible gives forth is uh, evil cannot happen to a man who's keeping his word. And by evil, he means, you know, God's judgment that would come upon a person for their sin. You're not under judgment. If you're a true believer in God, walking, walking before him, you know, there, there might be things that come upon you uh, through the enemy. There might be uh, tribulation uh, that we go through, but God is not going to punish us if our heart uh, is right before him. Uh, Proverbs seventeen thirteen. Whoso rewards evil for good, evil shall not depart from his house. You know, so wow. God, God is not going to do that. Mm. And so again, what we're seeing here is that, um, you know, because some have <clears throat> the, the opinion or the impression that God is, you know, up there with the sledgehammer just you know, waiting for somebody to get out of line so we can whack them uh, real good. Mm. But he loves us. He loves us. And um, this is not trying to say that um, bad things don't happen to good people, uh, b because they do. Yeah. Uh, a person could be in the wrong place at the wrong time. Uh, but we're making forth a general statement here is that um, if your heart is right with God, you know, he's going to protect you. He's going to watch over you. Uh, you know, there's not going to be bad consequences because of, because of our, um, because of sin coming upon us if we're living a life of victory. Mm -hmm. Uh, Proverbs 1, 10, and 11. My son, if sinners entice you, do not consent. If they say, come with us, let's lie and wait for blood, let us ambush the innocent without cause. I said, don't, don't go along with them. Don't, don't do that. Uh, Proverbs 6, 16 through 18. Uh, there are six things which the Lord hates, yea, seven are abomination to him. Lying eyes, uh, I'm sorry, haughty eyes, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked imaginations, feet that run rapidly to evil, a false witness who utters lies, and one who spreads strife among the brethren. And so there are some things that God hates, and that's seven, seven things that he hates. But a Christian is not going to be living that way. You know, the people that do those things, yes, they will suffer. They'll reap what they sow. Uh, Proverbs seventeen twenty six. Also, to punish the just is not good, nor to strike princes for equity. Yes. And so the author... This lesson is simply saying God, God would never do that. You know, he's telling us not to, to uh, strike the innocent. You know, he's not going to either. You know, how much more? <laughs> well, our Heavenly Father. Uh, Proverbs 26.2.
As the bird by wandering, as the swallow by flying, so the curse causeless shall not come. Yes. The curse causeless shall not come. Praise the Lord. And that applies to, to the enemy's curses as well. You know, if you're walking with a pure heart before God, they're, they're going to the enemy's curses are, are just going to bounce back. You know, if you're walking in faith, walking in victory, um, that's, that's a good promise to claim. You know, when, if you sense any attack whatsoever from the enemy, yeah, just remind the Lord of this verse, the curse causeless cannot alight, it will not alight. Psalm 91, 11, 9 through 11. Because thou hast made the Lord, which is my refuge, even the Most High, thy habitation, there shall, be, there shall no evil befall thee, neither shall any plague come near thy dwelling. For he shall give his angels charge over thee, to keep thee in all thy ways. These are wonderful promises. You know that when a person walks with God, you've made him your refuge. He's your dwelling place. You know, you're abiding under the shadow of the Almighty. I promise no evil will befall you. Psalm 121, 7 and 8. The Lord shall pre preserve thee from all evil. He sh shall preserve thy soul. The Lord shall preserve thy going out and thy coming in from this time forth and even forevermore. Isn't that a beautiful promise? Yes. Mm -hmm. The Lord will protect us from all evil. I know he's protected me many times in my life. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Things could have turned out a lot differently in many, many situations. He can stop a conveyor belt from going. <laughs> you had some experience with that? <laughs> no, I'm relating your story. Oh, yeah. I've had some close calls in the woods, too. <laughs> with chainsaws and trees oh, falling. And, praise the Lord. But he's, you know, I just Same thank true. him. Yes. But I, I made it a habit, you know, when I before I go in the woods, just pray. So, Lord, good, good idea. Mm -hmm. You know, that machinery. Just, Never you know, know, keep me conscious of my surroundings, keep me aware. Mm -hmm. You know, and I, I really do what I can to that. Mm -hmm. You know, and then I'll leave the rest to him. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Amen. You know, you go out there and they got those widow maker trees. That I know it. They just come down out of nowhere. It, it can happen. There's there's been several in our community that that has happened to. Mm -hmm. You know, they just found them. Wow. You know, where a branch came down and mm -hmm. and got them. Yeah. Uh, Proverbs one thirty three. But he who listens to me shall live securely and shall be at ease from the dread of evil. You know, a wonderful promise. He who listens to me 
shall live securely and shall be at ease from the dread of evil. You know, so we shouldn't have that fear. Perfect love will cast out fear. And again, that's, that's I believe, what, what our, the author of this study is trying to say. You know, that when we're trusting in the Lord, we don't have to fear, you know, this sudden calamity. Proverbs twelve twenty one. There shall no evil happen to the just, but the wicked shall be filled with trouble. Proverbs thirteen twenty one. Uh, yeah, I, I just read that one. Okay, I'm sorry. I, I have a question. Uh, okay. No, this this I, I don't I don't see this as. Uh, in other words, just people. Evil happens to them all the time. The wicked, wicked, uh, get away with things all the time. So is this a, in essence, a speaking of their eternity? Mm. Actually, We're, I was in 1221. Okay, 1221. Okay, because we have a 1321. <laughs> I must have left. Yeah, can, can yeah, it's certainly not a, not a blanket statement. No harm befalls the righteous, because as you said, we know that yes. that there are accidents. You know, yeah. things things do happen. That the wicked are filled with trouble. I, I believe it is a general principle, for sure. You know, because sooner or later, the wicked, you know, it's going to catch up with them. Oh yeah, that's you know, true. they do get a buy with this, that, and the other thing, but in the long run. Yeah. yeah, so, as you said, for sure, in eternity, but normally in the long run, in this world, too, they're, there's, they're going to reap what they sow. Yeah. You know, that's a general yeah. general law. Uh, 1321 is, is very similar. Evil pursues sinners, but to the righteous, good shall be repaid. And again, that, that's a general principle. Uh, 19, Proverbs 19.23 The fear of the Lord leads to life so that one may sleep satisfied untouched by evil. So the fear of the Lord leads to life. You know, and Gives you a good sound rest because you don't have a guilty conscience, you know, That's disturbing you all night long. Mm -hmm. uh, Ecclesiastes 8 5. He who keeps a royal command experiences no trouble, for a wise heart knows the proper time. And procedure. He who keeps the royal command experiences no trouble or evil thing. And again, these are general principles. Let's not say it would never happen. Uh, but if we're talking about the royal command of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, you know, then of course he's going to reward us accordingly. Okay, let's go to the New Testament, 1 Peter 3, 12. That, and I also put 13 and 14. For the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous, and his ears are open unto their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. And who is he that will harm you? if ye be followers of that which is good. But, and if ye suffer for righteousness' sake, happy are ye, and be not afraid of their terror, neither be troubled. Mm -hmm. So verse 13, he says, uh, who's there to harm you if you prove zealous for doing good? You know, God's not going to do it. His face is toward those who do evil. 
but his eyes are upon the righteous. But verse 14 said, but even if you should suffer, and of course suffering normally happens uh, from the unrighteous to the righteous, and for righteousness' sake, even if you should suffer for the sake of righteousness, you're blessed. Do not fear their intimidation. Do not be troubled. Mm-hmm. You know, don't let that disturb your sleep. Yeah. I'm so blessed, you know, reading the book of Acts, Peter sound asleep you know, the, more, the night before his execution or what they thought was going to be his execution. Mm-hmm. You know, he had a clean conscience. Yeah. Yeah. Lord, I'm in your hands. It's okay. Yeah. You know, you're going to watch over me. Mm-hmm. Then finally, Proverbs, I'm sorry, Psalm 34, 19, and 20. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. He keeps all of his bones, not one of them is broken. That's a messianic psalm. Uh, verse 20 but many are the afflictions of the righteous but the Lord delivers him out of them all okay, let's go on to our next uh, principle uh, God can bless only when faith is exercised well faith is necessary we saw that mm-hmm. There is a sense in which um, God causes the rain to fall upon the just and the unjust. Yes. Yes. And, and so, um, again, I don't want to put box, God in the box and say God can only bless mm-hmm. when faith is exercised. Because he, he is so loving, he can bless whenever he wants to bless. Mm-hmm. But, but faith, of course, is what enables us to enter into the blessing of the Lord but he can certainly bless the undeserving. He did us, you know, when he opened our eyes to see our own sin. Mm-hmm. But, but again, what, the, what he's stressing in this principle is the faith uh, needs to be an operation to, to bring about the blessing that we're praying for. Isaiah 55, 11. Now 45, 11, excuse me. <clears throat> Thus saith the Lord, the Holy One of Israel and his Maker, Ask me of things to come concerning my sons, and concerning the work of my hands, command ye me. Now isn't that a remarkable verse? Powerful verse? Concerning the work of my hands, command ye me. What, what does it mean? I believe that it authorizes us to rise up in faith, to, to really press in to the, to the promises of God. Mm. Mm. You know, because if it's a promise, if it's part of the covenant that he made with us, um, I can see where faith could rise up in in a person's heart to a certain point mm-hmm. where, he, where he commands it to be done. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, um, I, I've seen it before in healing where, you know, somehow just faith rises up and, you know, it's just declared and, and it happens. And... Yeah, it's a good question. What does that mean? Because on its face, that's a very powerful promise concerning the works of my hand. You know, if this is a promise, if this is, if this is part of the covenant, and again, it, it would never be with a presumptuous spirit. It would never be with, um, you know, any arrogance or anything like that. It would always be in all humility but there would be a rising up in the spirit. 
you know, um, that may be what Joshua did uh, when they surrounded. He, you know, he said, shout for the city is yours. Mm -hmm. You know, and he, he commanded it. You know, and the Lord, of course, had authorized him and given him the instruction. But, but Joshua issued a command. Yeah. You know, go forward for God has given you the city. And yeah. Of course, God revealed that to him, but he, he's, you know, concerning the work of my hand, commanding me. Mm -hmm. You know, and the walls came down. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Lord, open our eyes. You know, help us to realize our inheritance. That's my prayer. Uh, Matthew 7, 7 through 11. Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. For every one that asks, receives. And he that seeks, finds. And to him that knocks, it shall be opened. Or what man is there of you, whom if his son asks bread, will he give him a stone? Or if he asks a fish, will he give him a serpent? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your Father, which is in heaven, give good things to them that ask him? Yeah, that ask him. Yeah, so again, these, these wonderful promises. God can bless when, you know, the faith is exercised. When you ask him, you know, it's that trusting confidence that a child has uh, to ask his father for an egg <laughs> he knows dad's good he's not going to hand me a snake <laughs> and that's what he's trying to convey to our minds that man if you as humans as parents you know you just want to bless your ch children how much more and see it's verses like this that build up our faith you know when we read them and say lord you know, you want to answer these prayers. Mark ten fifty one fifty two. And Jesus answered and said unto him, What wilt thou that I should do unto thee? The blind man said unto him, Lord, that I might receive my sight. And Jesus said unto him, Go thy way, thy faith hath made the whole. And immediately he received his sight mm -hmm. and followed Jesus in the way. Yes. And so it, his, his prayer request was specific. Jesus said, what do you want? And he was specific. <laughs> I want to see. And he said, your faith has made you well. And so when faith was exercised, uh, he received his healing. Matthew 15, 7. I'm sorry, John 15, 7. If ye abide in me, and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. That's, again, another staggering promise. If, if his word abides in us, we abide in him. Ask whatever you wish, and it shall be done to you. By this is my Father glorified that you bear much fruit. John 16, 23, 24, and 26. <clears throat> and in that day ye shall ask me nothing. Verily, verily, I say unto you, 
Whatsoever ye shall ask the Father in my name, he will give it to you. Hitherto have ye asked nothing in my name? Ask, and ye shall receive, that your joy may be full. These things have I spoken unto you in Proverbs. But the time comes when I shall no more speak unto you in Proverbs. But I shall show you plainly of the Father. At that day ye shall ask in my name. And I say not unto you that I will pray the Father for you. For the Father himself loves you because ye have loved me and have believed that I came out from God. Amen. Again, wonderful promise to ask the Father in Jesus' name. James 4, 2 and 3. Ye lust, and have not. Ye kill, and desire to have, and cannot obtain. Ye fight and war, yet ye have not, because ye ask not. Ye ask, and receive not, because ye ask amiss, that ye may consume it upon your lusts. And so here we see a condition <clears throat> for answered prayer. It has to be the motive of the heart, the right motive, if it's... Uh, you know, selfish motives, he's, he's not going to answer. And so God blesses when faith is exercised. Now our ninth uh, principle here uh, is man is where he is because he's chosen to be there. Mm -hmm. Another way people say that is you have all of God, you know, that you want to have. Or you're as holy as you want to be. And so it talks about our, our free moral agency is involved. That, that we, have a, we have a role to play. We, we need to obey the word of God. Walk with God. You know, have those devotions with the Lord. If we expect our prayers to be answered. I don't think we'll read all of Deuteronomy 28. But Deuteronomy 28, the first 14 verses, God says that if you walk with him, if you obey him, you're going to be blessed mm -hmm. in, in all areas of your life. Yeah, but if you disobey, from 15 to 68, there's there's all of the curses. But let's, let's just read the blessing portion. Deuteronomy 28. Now it shall be, if you will diligently obey the Lord your God, being careful to do all of his commandments, which I'm commanding you to be day, today. Notice this is a, a conditional statement. If you will diligently obey God, you know, and do what he's asked you to do. And Deuteronomy 30 says the essence of his to love him with all of your heart, uh, to obey his voice, to hold fast to him. So he said, if you do that diligently, the Lord your God will set you high above all nations of the earth, and you'll be, and all these blessings shall come upon you and overtake you if you'll obey the Lord your God. Again, that conditional, if you'll obey him. You're going to be blessed. Blessed shall you be in the city. Blessed shall you be in the country. Blessed shall be the offspring of your body, your children. Produce of your ground, the offspring of your beast, the increase of your herd, the young of your flock. You should be blessed in your basket, in your kneading bowl. Blessed shall you be when you go in. Blessed shall you be when you go out. The Lord will cause your enemies to rise up before you to be defeated before you. They'll come out against you one way, they'll flee before you seven ways. The Lord will command the blessing upon you in your barns and in all that you put your hand to do. Isn't that a wonderful promise? Yes. He'll command it. 
and he will bless you in the land which the Lord your God gives you. The Lord will establish you as a holy people to himself, as he swore to you, if you keep his commandments of the Lord your God and walk in his ways. Again, it's always our choice, but the blessings are there. So all the people of the earth shall see that you are called by the name of the Lord, and they shall be afraid of you, and the Lord will make you abound in prosperity, the offspring of your body, the offspring of your beast, the produce of your ground, the land which the Lord your God swore to your fathers to give you. The Lord will open up his good storehouse of the heavens, give rain to your land in its season, and bless all the work of your hand. You shall lend to many Nations, but not you shall not borrow. And the Lord shall make you the head, and not the tail, and you only shall be above, and you shall not be underneath. If both the fourth and fifth time we've seen that, if you will listen to the commandment of the Lord your God, which I charge you today to observe carefully, and do not turn back. Turn aside from the words which I have commanded you today, to the right or to the left, to go after other gods to serve them. But it shall come about if you do not obey the Lord your God. Then this exact opposite consequence just go on and on and on. The terrible consequences that come from disobedience. That reminds me of an occasion that was very precious. I look at it, back at it, be one of the high, higher points in my life. And this was on our trip to uh, Ukraine. And I think it was about 88, uh, 98 or 99. So it's been 25 years ago almost. Um, but one of the <clears throat> things we did, we traveled outside into the... Um, in, they call it the steppes. Mm -hmm. You know, it's the flat prairie land, very yeah. similar to South Dakota. And my mm -hmm. wife has relatives uh, that were still in that area. But we were taken out by a Lutheran mi minister. And, uh, you know, we're guests at a farm out there. Well, while we're out, and, I, and it's out in the middle of rural Ukraine. Mm -hmm. But uh, we were asked by the leadership in that area, the governmental leadership, you know, if I would give a talk or a speech on the free enterprise system, mm. you know, because they had just come out of communism mm. and were struggling in that particular year, inflation was about 700 and some percent. So you saw wow. so many people out in the street with a blanket and every, everything you could imagine, you know, carburetors from cars, motorcycles, wheels, uh -huh. you know, any anything they could find that they didn't absolutely need, they're out in the street like a like a big flea market, yes. you know, trying trying to just survive. Uh -huh. You know, so so I use this as my text, right? and I started out by describing a typical U.S. supermarket. Mm -hmm. And of course, they, you know, just trying to describe it, they they just couldn't comprehend. You know, talk about, you know, twenty eight varieties of coffee and down this aisle. And, yeah, you yeah. know, all all the different products readily available. And at that time, it's like ten percent of America's disposable income was spent on food. Uh -huh. You know, very low percent, but such abundance. And I said, how do you account? For this abundance, I said, Ukraine, uh, you have been blessed of God. You've been called the breadbasket of Europe. Your soils are as good or much better than the soil that we have in America, and and you are just struggling, you know, to put food on the table. I said, what is the difference? And then I. Gave him a short economics lesson mm -hmm. on the um, the means of production that under a free enterprise system, uh, the means of production are land, labor, and capital. And I said, under the communist system that you're just coming out of, you know, the government owned 
basically the means of production. They own the land, the machinery, and, and all that. And you know, you provided your labor. Uh, but their saying was to each according to their ability, to each according to their need. But it didn't turn out that way. <laughs> and I said the reason, one of the reasons why the free enterprise system is so productive is that if you own your land and if it's your pigs that you're watching after, you know, and if it's a matter of you trying to get a little bit of extra money to buy braces for your daughter's teeth that need some braces, I said, you'll get up at 3 o'clock in the morning when it's 20 below outside. You're going to leave your warm wife in the, the bed. You're going to get out there with that sow. And if you can save one or two more pigs, you know, that's going to provide you with a little extra funds to buy braces for your daughter. But if the government owns the land, and the government owns the pigs, you're not going to leave your warm bed at 3 o'clock in the morning, you know, just mm -hmm. to save one or two more pigs. You're going to say, you know, good luck, Sal. <coughs> you know, I'll see you at normal time, 8 in the morning. But I said that's one of the reasons that, that makes why the free enterprise system is, is so productive, because there's an individual incentive, um, you know, for a person to produce. Mm -hmm. And I said... Classical economics talks about three means of production, but I said, <clears throat> I see another one in the Bible, and that is character. You know, you have to, you have, to have character if, if you're going to make the free enterprise system work. Because to acquire capital, you have to go to the banker and convince him that you're honest, you're dependable, you're a hard worker, and then if he loans you the money to buy, you know, 20 sows to start your pig mm -hmm. farm, that at the end of the year, he's going to get his money back plus his interest. So I said, you have to have, you have to be men of character, uh, mm -hmm. or the free enterprise system will not work. Yeah, you know, so I gave him that talk, but I used Deuteronomy, mm -hmm. and I said, how do you get character? <laughs> you know, then, then I got into the gospel. But I said, it will not work without character. You know, you need to be honest, hardworking. You know, and under the, the old system that you came out of, you know, everything is by bribery and graft and who you know and, you know, grease the skids and... Mm -hmm. and they're saying that they had, that they told us, which to me describes the downfall of, of the socialist system. This is the saying that they had. They pretend to pay us, so we pretend to work. <laughs> <laughs> what is and, and, and that describes it, because like I said, you're not going to get up at 3 in the morning when it's 20 below to sit with that sow. You know, when you could be in bed, but a farmer will, yeah. you know, if, if he wants to, you know, just have that little extra, mm -hmm. you know, to take care of his the family needs, see if he is the one who receives that, then he's going to work harder. Mm -hmm. he's, it's not going to be an eight to five job. He's yeah. it's going to be a dawn till dusk. He's going to be out there hustling two or three jobs, whatever it takes you know, to make a goal of things. And I said, that's that's the big difference between socialism and, and the free enterprise system. Anyway, <laughs> I, I use the Bible, you know, to preach that to them. I said, you, you, you need Christ. You need, yeah. you know, it's not going to work unless you give your hearts to God mm -hmm. and, and obey the Lord. I said, these are the consequences. And I read through the thing. And I said, these blessings will come upon you. They'll overtake you. Your barn will be filled with plenty. You know, this is the word of God. Mm -hmm. So anyway, like I say, to me, I was, it was a thrilling 
opportunity because it, it was a um, it was a communist it was, it was a communist center uh, that was built you know to educate the youth under communism and here they had. You know, this Westerner <laughs> coming uh, and tell the come in. <laughs> so it was it was very enjoyable. I was wow, it was a so blessing. Good. Yeah, so this this of course is yeah. this principle. Um, we ha we have the free choice uh, to to pursue God. Mm -hmm. uh, Deuteronomy thirty verse fifteen and verse nineteen. See, I've set before you today life, prosperity, death, and adversity. 19 is similar. I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that I've set before you life and death, the blessing and the curse. So choose life in order that you and your descendants may live. I love verse 22 because it tells you how you choose life. Is by loving the Lord your God, by obeying his voice, by holding fast to him. You know, it's the same in the New Testament. Mm -hmm. We love him, we hold fast to him, we obey his voice. Okay, Joshua 24, 15. Again, we're talking about the will, making a decision. It has to be that firm Decision of the will. And Joshua made one here. If it is disagreeable in your sight to serve the Lord for yourself, if it is Disagreeable in your sight to serve the Lord. Choose for yourselves today whom you'll serve, whether the gods which your fathers serve, which are beyond the river, or the gods of the Amorites in whom land you are living. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Serve the Lord. So that just firm resolve, I'm going to serve God. You can do what you want to, but as for me, my house, this is how it's going to be. First Kings 18.21, Elijah and the prophets of Baal. <clears throat> and Elijah came unto all the people and said, How long halt ye between two opinions? If the Lord be God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. And the people answered him, not a word. Yeah, it was their choice. But he, but he, but he called them to make a choice. You can't just be in the middle. You know, you've got to decide one way or another. Um, how long will you halt between two opinions? And of course, when the fire came down, it, <laughs> you know they saw the power of God yes. but he made that decision in his heart long before the fire came down mm -hmm. he said I'm, I'm, I'm serving God wow. and at one time he said I'm the only one serving you he said no you got 7,000 others mm. you're not alone mm. uh, Galatians 6, 7 and 8 I think you'll recognize that one as verse on sowing and reaping. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man sows, that shall he also reap. For he that sows to his flesh shall of the, shall of the flesh reap corruption. But he that sows to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. Yes. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's our will, our choice is definitely involved in what we receive from the Lord. So our point 10, he just makes a few statements. 
Uh, God is not responsible for anyone failing to get the benefits of the cross. You know, the provision is ample. It's there. You know, it's up to us. Mm-hmm. Then the question comes, what about suffering children? Isn't God responsible? And the answer is, under the age of accountability, uh, the children are not responsible, and, and God isn't either. He's not punishing them. Evil is here as a result of man's choice of sin, for which God is not responsible. You know, it was man that brought sin into the world. Why doesn't God stop sin, sickness, deformity, starvation? Well, if you stop those effects, uh, then you must stop the cause. You know, take away man's free will. Amen. If you did that, we'd simply be robots. Mm-hmm. But he doesn't do that because he is demonstrating that love is the most important thing in the entire universe. And love cannot be forced. You know, it's got to come from the heart as an act of the free will. Mm-hmm. So, Father, we thank you for this lesson this evening, Lord. We thank you for your many and wonderful promises. And Father, we have read some tonight that that have staggered our imagination. Lord, because they are plain and they are powerful. And you are a God who cannot lie. You are a God who has given mankind so much. And Father, I pray that we would not live the rest of our lives as spiritual paupers when you have endowed us with the riches of heaven. And even tonight through these promises, you have given us the key to unlock uh, these heavenly treasures. And so, Father, I pray that we'll avail ourselves in much greater measure than anything we have ever experienced in the past. Lord, not to expend it upon our own lusts and desires, but Father, we want to prepare ourselves to be more effective in the service of of the kingdom of God and to see your kingdom spread in our community and our nation and throughout the world. And so, Father, to that end, bless this lesson to our understanding that we might walk in the truths that we have discussed. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.